Uh, before we get started tonight, I uh, want to thank um, our, our sponsors, our Cape Cod Five, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, Martha's Vineyard Savings, um, and like all uh, uh, of the books that are in, in our series, uh, they are available at Eight Cousins Bookseller. Um, if you got any questions, to so make sure you use the chat feature uh, down below. Um, and uh, so you know, we're going to be uh, doing a sharing screen, and it's going to be me doing it. So I, I hopefully, um, I, I won't screw that up like I'm in like my Zoom account's been doing. Um, uh, so, uh, so if, if something goes wrong, it's my fault. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, don't uh, it, don't blame Mr. Morozik. So. Uh, 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 I hope that that'll be fine. Our speaker today, Robert Morozik, is a five-term five -term congressman from Long Island. Um, and when he retired from Congress, uh, he's written 11 books, including the one tonight, in which uh, I'm really looking forward to this one, because this is a, one of those forgotten stories or little-known stories from World War II. Um, so would you welcome our speaker tonight, Robert Morozik. Well, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for inviting me to Cape Cod. I can't see the ocean from here. I'm in Ithaca, New York right now, but uh, I, uh, I spent half the year actually a bit north of in Cape Cod. Uh, I have owned a place on Monhegan Island off the coast of Maine since 1984, and, uh, and from my heart is most of the time. Uh, so tonight I wanted to talk to you about a book that uh, is, 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 involves a very remarkable woman. Uh, thousands and thousands of books have been written about men at war. I've written a few of them myself, some good ones. But uh, very few, relatively speaking, about women who made a difference uh, in uh, the Second World War. Uh, Florence was one of them. Uh, she was not only a, a war hero or a heroine, she was one of the most decorated American women in the Second World War. Uh, Harry Truman, President Truman, gave her the Medal of Freedom in 1947. Uh, one might ask, why, why is the story of Florence Finch a little more widely known? Um, we live in a time where you know, celebrities are celebrated for being celebrities uh, without having achieved anything in their life. Um, one of the most remarkable things about Florence was the deep sense of humility uh, she had. Um, and she never told anyone about what she did in World War II in saving hundreds of American lives. Um, she never even told her own children. And it wasn't until 1995, which was 50 years exactly after the end of, of the Second World War, when the United States Coast Guard decided to name their Pacific quarters in Hawaii after Florence Finch that notified her uh, and her children found out for the first time uh, that their mother had another life that they were totally unaware of. Um, the story starts with this young man whose photograph you're possibly looking at right now. His name was Charlie Ebersol. Uh, he was 16 years old uh, when the Spanish-American War started. He read the tales of of uh, Teddy Roosevelt leading the Rough Riders up San Juan Hill. He wanted very much to volunteer for the army, but he was too young. His parents uh, finally acceded to his desire when he was 17, and uh, he became a medic in the army, and he went to the Philippines in 1899. Uh, at that time, the war had really intensified. There were a lot of atrocities on both sides. 
the United States, which had defeated Spain and taken over the Philippines after a, a Spanish colony for 300 years, uh, the Spanish insurrectionists who challenged the Spanish initially welcomed the Americans until they found out that we want we wanted uh, the Philippines for ourselves. Uh, Charlie was a medic. Uh, he dealt with uh, the uh, result of the atrocities uh, on both sides, and I think it's fair to say that the war coarsened him a good deal. When it ended in 1902, he decided that he was not going back to Buffalo, where he grew up. He did not uh, appreciate the Buffalo winters any more than I appreciate the Ithaca winters, for that matter. But uh, he loved the Philippines, he loved the people, the culture. He decided to stay, and because it was an American occupation, uh, we decided to build schools and hospitals and roads. And Charlie became a contractor, and he was smart. Uh, he was ambitious, and uh, he did very well. And within a couple of years, he decided to own a plantation. And he bought a plantation in Isabella Province, north of Manila, uh, near the, the town of Santiago. And he built it into something very substantial. It ran for almost a mile on both sides of the Kalau River. Um, he met a young woman who he fell in love with, a Filipino woman. Her name was Maria Hermoso. She was very lovely. Um, and uh, there was another problem with the relationship. She was already married. She was married to a former Spanish soldier, and they had a, a young daughter, a toddler named Flaviana. Uh, but with the callousness that I think Charlie had, had, had developed, uh, with almost reptilian cold-bloodedness, he told Maria, I want you to come with me. Uh, there's no divorce in the Philippines, or there wasn't at that time, being a, a Catholic country. But she agreed to go with him, to live with him as his common law wife. And they had uh, five children together uh, while he was building the plantation. But the fourth child was uh, named Loring May Ebersol. Uh, she was to become Florence Finch, and I'll go into the reasons why she uh, abandoned the name Loring May Ebersole at the age of seven. But uh, Charlie and, and Maria lived on the plantation. If we could go to the next uh, photograph, Mark. <clears throat> that is... Uh, Lauren May Eversall in the middle, soon to become Florence, her brother Edward on the right, her older sister Norma on the left. At that time, when she was seven years old, uh, Flaviana, the young baby daughter of, of uh, Maria with her first husband, uh, reached the age of 17 and she was uh, a very lovely version of her mother. Uh, her mother was illiterate. She could speak Tagalog, which was an indigenous language. She never learned to uh, write in English. Uh, so Flaviana was a more sophisticated version of her mother. And at 17, she, just, she fell in love and decided to get married uh, with the support of her mother. And they were married, and two months later, uh, Charlie, who was not used to having anything taken away from him, rode on horseback to the village where Flaviana was living and told Flaviana that he wanted her to become his common law wife and to live with him. And she agreed. He was a powerful guy, he was charismatic, he was very wealthy. Uh, she came back to the plantation with Charlie and 
Charlie told Maria, uh, you have two choices. You can either leave or you can live in the house that we started on the plantation, the first house, with your children, our children. And Maria agreed to do that. But within a couple of years, she became increasingly morose, angry, bitter, understandably so. And she began beating her own children as if they were somehow responsible for uh, Charlie falling in love with Flaviana. So at the age of seven, uh, knowing what was happening to, to Loring May, uh, Charlie had a good friend in Manila who had just started a new school called the Union Church Hall School for Mestizos. Mestizos being a name uh, to characterize young women who were half Filipino and half American. And so Florence left the plantation at the age of seven, never to return, and lived from then on essentially on her own. Uh, she went to that school, uh, the Union uh, Church Hall School, until she was 17 years old. Uh, she learned to become independent. She learned to deal with prejudice. Uh, Mestizos were viewed as half-breeds. Even the, the Protestants who created the, the school uh, had, a, had a pitying sense about them. And Florence, uh, 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 forgive me for forgetting how to tell you how, how she became Florence. She did not respond to her birth name when she got to the school. And the superintendent of the school, Harvey Bordner, who had been there 20 years and had dealt with a lot of kids, understood uh, intuitively that she was ashamed of herself. And he suggested to her that because she was making a new start at the school, that perhaps she would like to start with a new name. Uh, and he proposed Florencia, and she began to react, respond to that name. And as I said, she lived there for, for 10 years, and at 17, graduated first in her class, went to college, graduated first in her class. Uh, her first job was with the Army-Navy YMCA because then we had the Pacific Fleet based in the Philippines. Uh, the Army-Navy YMCA was a huge installation with 500 rooms for uh, sailors and soldiers uh, traveling through the Philippines. <clears throat> she went to work for the executive director. Within a few years, she was essentially running the whole organization. Uh, Let's go to the next picture, Mark, if we could. Now, that is Florence in 1938, uh, shortly before World War II began. She had grown into a lovely young woman. Um, the director of the Army-Navy YMCA, H.J. Schofield, had fallen in love with her and proposed marriage. Uh, she did not want to hurt his feelings, but she did not love him. She did fall in love shortly thereafter with a rather dashing uh, agent of naval intelligence uh, named Charlie Smith, who was called Bing Smith, largely because he had an uncanny resemblance to the crooner, Bing Crosby. They were different men. Uh, Bing Crosby was 5'6 or 5'7. Uh, Smith, uh, soon to be her husband, uh, was 6'2, and he was a star pitcher on Pacific All Fleet baseball team. Uh, and she fell head over heels in love with him. Uh, Charlie. Uh, as I had worked for Naval Intelligence in Manila, uh, and one of his colleagues, the PD head of Army Intelligence for the Philippines, for the United States Army, 
was a man named Carl Engelhardt, who was a lieutenant colonel. And uh, he was looking for someone to become his executive assistant. And Bing Smith uh, introduced Florence to Carl Engelhardt. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Mark. Nothing Smith um, at the Army Navy uh, YCA, and uh, he introduced her to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Engelhardt, and she got the job working for the deputy head of Army Intelligence. Engelhardt, who plays a, a, a big part in this in this book or in the story of Florence's life, certainly during World War II was a brilliant intelligent agent. We can go to the next slide. Uh, been military attache in Tokyo uh, three years between 1928 and 1931. He spoke fluent Japanese by, by the time he left uh, with Tokyo accident uh, as far as the Japanese were concerned. They were, they were stupefied by just how Articulate he was in Japanese and and, and the uh, fluency of his of his uh, accent. Uh, he saw the war coming. He saw the in the wake of the of the Japanese invasion of China that they saw were seeking to become a world class military power. And he began creating a network of intelligence agents all over the Far East. And he began uh, working on intelligence reports based upon the raw material he was getting. Uh, he did it with a fellow British agent. And, and shortly after they began sending these intelligence reports back to London, he heard back from uh, Winston Churchill uh, about how uh, effective those reports were and how welcome they were. He did not get the same reception from General Douglas MacArthur or his staff. The head of intelligence for Douglas MacArthur was a colonel named Charles Willoughby. Uh, his birth name was Adolf Weichenbach. Uh, he was born in Germany. Uh, Benito Mussolini was one of the early heroes. MacArthur referred to him as his fascist. Uh, Willoughby refused to accept the intelligence that Engelhardt was sending him that the Japanese move in the Pacific was imminent. Um, and it came, of course, on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And uh, 12 hours later, launched uh, air attacks on the Philippines. They invaded the Philippines uh, in late December of uh, 1941. And the Americans were... The Americans were largely unprepared uh, to take on the Japanese invasion force. Engelhardt and Bing Smith withdrew under orders from MacArthur to the fortress of, of Corregidor, and uh, Florence remained uh, in Manila. Uh, with the fall of Bataan, uh, the remaining troops and nurses on Bataan uh, moved over to Corregidor, which was then placed under attack by the Japanese. And uh, during that uh, period of time, Florence's husband, Bing Smith, uh, had gone back to serve on a PT boat that he had served on uh, prior to the war. And uh, he was killed in action, saving a fellow crewmate and was given the Distinguished Service Cross by Douglas MacArthur, the second 
highest award for valor uh, to the Medal of Honor. Florence never would have known that or wouldn't have known it till the end of the war. But when Corregidor fell to the Japanese, Carl Engelhardt was there at the negotiations and the surrender of Corregidor, again, because of his fluency in Japanese. And he so impressed one of the Japanese officers who was a member of the royal family that the officer asked him if there was anything he could do for him, knowing that Carl Engelhardt was going to be going into captivity in a prison. And Carl said, yes, there was. There was one thing that he could do for him, and that was to take a carbon of the medal that Ben had received, the Distinguished Service Cross, which of course was given to him posthumously. And he asked, and Carl asked the Japanese officer to take it to Florence to let her know that Bing had been killed, uh, which the Japanese officer did. And it was then that Florence learned of his death uh, and made a determination that she was going to do everything she could uh, to help defeat the Japanese occupying authority. She wasn't sure what it was going to be, but she made a commitment uh, in memory of, of Bing that she would do that. Shortly thereafter, she learned about a job at the Philippine Liquid Fuel Union, which dispensed all fuel to the Japanese armed forces, the Navy and the Army, all the gasoline, the diesel fuel, kerosene, all of it. What was left over could be rationed to the Philippine people. Florence began a job there. One of her jobs was to fill out warehouse receipts and purchase coupons for rationed gasoline and diesel fuel. And a few months after she began working there, an underground uh, mail system was created between uh, people of Manila and the Americans who were now in a huge prison camp after the Bataan Death March called Cabanatuan. There were about 40,000 Americans in that prison camp uh, starving to death, dying by numbers in the neighborhood of 500 to 1,000 a week. Engelhart got a message out under the through this system uh, to Florence and told her that the men were were dying both of starvation and illness and was there any way she could help and it was at that time that Florence saw in the newsletter for the liquid fuel union where she worked that two men had been arrested for falsifying purchase coupons for gasoline. And it struck her that because she was filling out legitimate warehouse, coupon, uh, warehouse receipts and purchase coupons, that she could create coupons uh, and give them to people in the underground. But she didn't know anybody in the underground, so she started her own small network, including um, a man who worked at the uh, Liquid Fuel Union with her, who did have friends in the underground. And they began to divert fuel from the, the Japanese military to the underground. Initially, no more than 200, 250 gallons a week. But you can imagine at that time that that was very valuable when it was uh, highly rationed to the people of the Philippines. And initially Florence said, we're going to sell it on the black market and we're going to take the money for that and we're going to buy food and we're going to buy medicine and we're going to smuggle it into the Cabana Tuan prison camp, which is what she did, uh, organizing that network, 
and uh, finding the people who could act as couriers uh, to get the food and medicine into the camp. Initially to Carl Engelhart and then indirectly uh, to uh, friends and then many others within the camp through, through Carl Engelhart. Uh, the next slide will show you a, a photograph of, of Colonel Engelhart in the Cabanatuan prison camp uh, in 1943 uh, after things had stabilized a bit and the number of deaths had diminished rapidly. Uh, Florence was not the only person or the only network smuggling food and medicine into the camp. Uh, and they were largely responsible for being able to supplement the very best base ration of waste, which was the only thing the Japanese were supplying to the prisoners, uh, and augment that and allow a lot more Americans to survive than otherwise been the case. Florence ended up diverting tons of fuel uh, from the Japanese military to not only saving the Americans at the Gabonatron prison camp, but the Americans and British who were confined as civilians to the Santo Tomas prison camp in Manila, and then to the underground itself, which was organizing to fight against the Japanese military all over the, the Philippines. She did this for two and a half years. Uh, un literally under the noses of the Japanese. There were 98 Japanese officers at the Liquid Fuel Union. Uh, she had a very laborious way of having to try to divert the fuel and then cover up what she had done by coming in very early on Monday morning and collecting and, and, and going through all of the warehouse receipts and purchase coupons to find the ones that she had falsified because otherwise the Japanese would have immediately known that 200, 300, 500 gallons of fuel uh, didn't add up, was missing. It wasn't uh, until October of 1944 that a courier of Florence's was caught by the Japanese and tortured. And under torture revealed that Florence was the head of the network uh, that was supplying uh, food and medicine to the camp. And she was arrested and brought to a place called the airport studio, which was uh, headquarters of the Kempe Tai, which was the Japanese secret police and there underwent substantial torture uh, by living in a, a cell, which was a former closet, two feet by four feet. They hooked up wires to her fingers and with a transformer ran electric current through her body. She was raped by prison guards, all to try to degrade her enough for her to reveal who her contacts were in the underground, <clears throat> but she refused to tell them. She admitted and confessed to her own role, but refused to uh, give the names of the people she served with. Many of them were caught anyway. She was one of the few who survived from her own network, but it was not because of her. In January of 1945, at a political prison, shortly before she was to be beheaded, uh, MacArthur, who had led the invasion of the Philippines in 1944 at Leyte Gulf, sent a flying squad of the 1st Cavalry Division into Manila to save uh, the prisoners who, le who were left, one of them was Florence. She weighed 77 pounds at that point, at the end of the war. She had gone into the war at 120. She was very close to death by starvation 
uh, and was nursed back to health. And later in 45, about a month and a half later, uh, she learned because she was an American citizen through her father and married to a decorated American military hero that she would be allowed to repatriate to the United States of America. Of course, she had never been to the United States of America. She only knew about America through the letters that she uh, received from her aunt in Buffalo. That was Charlie's sister. And she wrote to her aunt in Buffalo and asked if she could come. And her aunt said, absolutely. They had lost touch on the week of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Florence sailed across the Pacific by herself and then took a train across the United States by herself. And arriving in Buffalo, began a new life in the United States. Uh, then a couple of months, she felt very uncomfortable being there because the war was still raging in the Pacific. The Marine Corps and the Army had invaded Okinawa. It wasn't going particularly well. And Florence decided to enlist in the military to go back to the Pacific to uh, redeem her pledge to her late husband. Um, she volunteered for the U.S. Coast Guard. She was undergoing training when the war ended uh, with the dropping of the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And at that point, when Florence was released, uh, after she learned that Carl Engelhardt had survived, uh, not only Cabanatuan, but what were called death ships, three of them, <clears throat> because the Japanese knew that the war was going to, to go badly for them. They moved the prisoners, most of them, out of the Philippines to replace Japanese workers in mines and factories. Uh, Carl was put on a ship to go uh, to Japan. It was sunk by an American submarine. He survived. He was put on a second ship. It was sunk by American aircraft, military aircraft. He was put on a third ship, <laughs> ultimately got there and went to a military factory in Korea. But he survived the war. He came back through the Philippines only to learn that everyone he had served with in his network had died. Uh, he tried to find out what happened to Florence. Uh, ultimately, he did at the end of the war. It was then he learned what she had done on his behalf and the hunts of others that she had saved. And it was through Carl that she earned the Met freedom from President Truman. At that point, she turned her back basically on what she had done. She did not view herself as being at all heroic. She uh, in Buffalo, a young man who had fought in Europe during the war. They moved to Ithaca when he got a job with the Agway Corporation and she raised two children there with her husband. He died young in 1968. She became a deacon in the Presbyterian Church. And at the end of 2016, at the age of 101, passed away here in Ithaca, New York. Uh, right up till the end, she was a mentor uh, at her nursing home, uh, she would go to prison by the staff at the nursing home. When someone had given up on life, they sent Florence in to talk to the person, to talk about why they'd be cherishing every day, saving the days they had. And she maintained that level of optimism 
the forward thinking right up to the end. Um, it was a privilege for me to research and write her story. I've written 11 books, and I know old politicians are prone to exaggeration, but this is the best story I've ever had a chance to write about. And uh, uh, I think you would uh, find her story worthy, uh, particularly in these times. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. It's a story. Thank you, Congressman. That was awesome. Um, how, um, if you got any questions, uh, make sure you use the chat feature down below. Um, how did you become aware of her story? How, um, it, you're obviously living in Ithaca, she was living in Ithaca, but how did you, who, uh, where did you become aware of her and how did you learn more about this? Yeah, thank you, Mark. It was very serendipitous, actually. Uh, I, she worked at Cornell for 30 years as an administrator in the Far East Studies Department. I was a government major at Cornell back between 63 and 67. And our paths might have crossed at that time. I took a couple of courses in that Far East, and, uh, Far East Studies program. But uh, I never would have known about the story. Again, serendipity. I happen to be in New York. I, I wrote and co-directed a feature film a few years ago called called Congressman. Uh, and the creative producer who got me my cast was a wonderful cast with Pete Williams and George Hamilton and uh, Elizabeth Marvel, Jane Atkinson, many others. Anyway, his name is Fred Roos. And Fred produced all of Francis Ford Coppola's movies from Apocalypse Now on, including the Godfather movies. He's won two Academy Awards. <clears throat> and he happened to be in New York in early 2017 for um, what they were calling the Godfather reunion, where Francis and Al Pacino and Bob De Niro and, you know, the rest of the principles were coming together in New York and Fred was for that and I happened to be in New York to come on over to the hotel have a drink I did and when I got there the first thing he did was show the New York Times at me and it was an obituary and he said did you read this obituary of this woman Florence Finch he said it's absolutely amazing and, the, and I, I never would have seen the obituary because I was traveling and I, I wasn't reading the Times was traveling. And he said, you know, I spent two years when we made Apocalypse Now uh, in the Philippines. I love those people, their culture. I'd love to go back and make, <laughs> and make this movie. So why don't you go get the story? <laughs> and so when I got back to Ithaca, I contacted the daughter of Florence and, uh, and said, well, we have a lot of people who are interested in the story because of the Times obituary. And it turned out that her brother, uh, who was a parks, director, parks and recreation director in, in Denver, Colorado, read an earlier nonfiction book of mine, a World War II nonfiction book of mine, called A Dawn Like Thunder. And he said to his sister, look, if, if he can mom's story with the same reverence that he gave to that book that I read about, that was about a doomed torpedo squadron, Pacific, he said, he's the guy to write the book. So that's how I, I learned about the story and that's how I got the right story and it was critical to get the rights from the family because so much of the detail that went into the book came from 
letters. Florent was a prolific letter writer. Uh, from the time 1928 when her father died and her aunt in Buffalo reached out to her and said, I want to be in close contact with you. And Florence was 15 years old uh, at that time. Um, they exchanged letters right up to the war. Um, Florence's aunt had kept letters, all the letters that Charlie had written up until his death uh, from the Philippines. So learning the story, learning about her, how she came of age, what it was like to be a mestiza in the Union uh, Church Hall School, uh, how her views developed uh, on war, uh, her relationship with Bing Smith, so many of the elements that made the story, I think, as compelling as it was, were there in all the letters that were saved by the people that Florence wrote to. So that made the job easier. When, obviously, they, they were, they must have been glad to, t to um, share the story, but as you approach the family and say you want to write about her, what what do you say? What do you know that I, I, how, how do you make that introduction? How, how do you get that started? Well, when I got back to Ithaca, uh, Florence's daughter Betty lives here with her husband and family. <clears throat> Found her name in a Google people search. I have a call. I left a message. She had no idea who I was. Um, she did call back and indicated to me that she already received numerous inquiries. I said I could certainly understand that because of the extraordinary nature of her mother's life and story. Uh, I said I'd already written a number of books and uh, I would be happy to uh, let her see those books. And she said, well, my brother and I are going to make this decision. And I said, well, um, I'd be happy to let him take a look at my book as well. And, and used to, and uh, I said, it was, it was her brother who really <laughs> came back and said, I already read his book. And, uh, you know, I think he could be the one. Uh, there were certain elements of the story that were a lot harder uh, to track down. Florence refused or claimed to her children that she had no memories before she began school at the age of seven on her own in Manila. And I thought to myself, you know, most of us have got memories earlier than seven. Um, and um, Florence's children had no awareness of the Dickensian nature of Florence's early life. So in Manila, in researching, um, I'm a good researcher. And in Manila, I, I thought to myself, if Charlie owned a big plantation, um, Chances are there were records associated with that plantation uh, in, in the Bella province, and it turned out there were. And not only were there records, but it turned out, as I mentioned earlier, you had Charlie first with Maria, and then with Maria's daughter, and he had children with both of them. And the children ended up in battle, a court battle, over the plantation. And who was going to inherit what from the plantation? Indicated it was very substantial. He was a very wealthy man. And in reading those documents, I found 80 pages of yellow documents, hard copies. And there were affidavits by Maria and Florence, excuse me, and but not by Florence, by Fl Flaviana, a second common law, and others 
which went into the origins of the marriages and how they met and how things ended up. And uh, that really enabled me to tell the early part of the story, which I thought was vital to give readers an, an understanding of, of uh, how, where she came from and why she had this incredible uh, uh, self-reliance and an ability for two and a half years to out the Japanese um, and, and, and do this very dangerous work uh, until, she was, until she was arrested, to live with that level of tension and terror as others in her network were caught. Did she ever, you, you just touched on the fact she didn't have a, a memory or claimed to not have any memory before she was seven. Did she ever reestablish any kind of relationship with her father or when she moved away and went to school, was that it? Um, her father wrote letters to her uh, telling her that he was proud of her, but she never went back to the plantation. And to the best of my research capabilities, they never met after she left home at the age of seven. Uh, it was a very challenging family existence back up there on the plantation, uh, you know, between the two common law wives and, and, and 10 children. Um, but Charlie, for whatever fault he had, uh, did believe in a strong education. He brought his kids up to learn to read and write English before Florence was sent away to school. Uh, he was a complex man. But uh, it helped to uh, me to understand, you know, where she came from and uh, what formed her into the very strong, independent person she became for the rest of her life. Um, for those in the audience, that if the if the name Cabanatuan uh, rings a bell, um, there has been a couple of books and, and movies made about that. They had a lot of prisoners there would survive the Bataan death march. So it, um, it was, that was, wouldn't you say, uh, Congressman, that was one of the worst of the worst in a, in a, in a, in, in kind of a um, strange way that being in Cabanatuan was about as bad as conditions as you could find if you were an American POW with the, uh, uh, under the Japanese. So um, what, what was it that she was able to, or that her ring was able to smuggle into them? Well, you know, Americans are very uh, uh, genitive and flexible and intellectually curious. One of the senior American prisoners was assigned a job in a barn where Filipinos bring flies to the Japanese on ox carts would deposit the flies in the barn and they would then be distributed uh, to the Japanese guards and, and people who were running this camp. I mean, that was huge. As I indicated when they started out, there were in the neighborhood of 40,000 prisoners in that one camp. So it required a lot of material to come in for the Japanese. And it was that senior prisoner who began bribing the Filipino laborers who were transporting uh, spies into the camp and paying them first to, to take messages out from prisoners to people that they knew in Manila and were hopeful to be able to help, and also uh, messages back from those people into the camp. Um, 
Carl Engelhardt essentially put out requests for different types of medication, medicines to deal with malaria, quinine, uh, being one of them, of course. And so when Florence began getting the money from the black market after selling the fuel, was buying the things that would make a difference for the prisoners. More than that, she was also sending in money for Carl Hart to bribe guards uh, to give them additional vegetables and fish heads and, and things that we wouldn't eat today, but which signed in the diet of rice, which was all that the Japanese were providing to the, to the prisoners at that time. And what was it again that Florence did in her later years when she came after the war? I and mean, she said she uh, she was trying to get. I to see that there's a question mark. What did the prisoners use? What, what did the I'm prisoners? Sorry, question use to bribe I think it was something people? to the effect. Yeah. What did the prisoners use to bribe the people transporting goods to the prison? Well, initially they came in with very little. Uh, these were the survivors of the Bataan Death March when 70,000 Americans and Filipinos were marched for 60 miles without food under a brutal sun, uh, many of whom died along the way. The survivors ended up in Kamatwan. Some of the money, uh, it was... Uh, quickly organized with those senior American officers running the camp. Uh, but they had very little to bribe the Japanese with. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, they'd have a camera or a wristwatch or, or a cigarette lighter. Uh, it was only when people like Florence, and she wasn't the only one. There were others who began smuggling money into the camp through that underground mail service, that prisoners had the money that they could use uh, to, uh, to bribe the guards. And in Florence's later years, what, what did she become? Uh, uh, you know, after she becomes a civilian, what, what, was, what was her life? Well, uh, when she moved uh, to Edmond, New York with her husband, she began working for Agway. Uh, she really had one child, uh, uh, and the second came soon thereafter. And Florence's husband uh, developed serious heart trouble. Uh, he had served with Patton's army uh, in Europe in World War II as the, he went across all the way from uh, France uh, into Germany. Uh, he had had a very tough war. Uh, he developed uh, heart disease and he left Agway, went to work for Cornell actually in a research facility. He was a trained chemist and uh, he could not work full time after his first heart attack. And that's when Florence realized she needed to go to work. <clears throat> and she sought and got working with Professor George Kanan uh, at, at, in the Cornell Government Department. And uh, uh, she worked for Cornell 30 years, as I indicated. Her husband died in 1968, and uh, it, uh, uh, she eventually retired, became very active in the Presbyterian Church, was elected of the church, uh, became a mentor to a lot of immigrants, the same way she was to the younger mestizos when she was uh, in the church hall school in Manila. I saw that a question popped up, two of them. One, uh, are any memorials to Florence? Yeah. Uh, there aren't any here in Ithaca, but yeah. a 
Pacific headquarters of the United States Coast Guard in Hawaii is named after Florence Finch, which uh, is, is a lot. Um, old broken down ex-members of Congress get a post office named after them. <laughs> but, but not the uh, not, not Pacific headquarters of, of the United States Coast Guard. Um, uh, the is, other question was, is, is there a movie in the works? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there I think there is. Uh, Fred Roos, the gentleman I was talking about earlier, who produced all of Francis Coppola's movies, he's taken it out. He wants the movie shot in the Philippines uh, with Philippine actors and actresses. Uh, he thought it might well work as a limited television series for five parts. Um, so when I say it's in the works, you know, I used to think that pound for pound, there was probably more bullshit in Washington, D.C. Uh, when it comes to human endeavor than any other occupation on Earth. But I think uh, La La Land might give uh, Washington a good run for money <laughs> when it comes to bullshit. So you never know. Hope so. And was Finch the name of her last husband? I'm sorry, repeat that, Mark. Was Finch the name of her last husband? Yes, his name is Robert Finch. Okay. So she was she began Lawrence May Ebersol, became Florence Ebersol Smith, and then Florence Ebersol Smith. All right. Well. Well, I want to. Th I want to thank you. Walk. Wonderful. Thank yeah, I want to thank you for joining us tonight, and um, and thank thank you for taking the time. Um, I hope uh, you've remained uh, healthy, safe, and sane throughout all of this. It's been an amazing story. Um, uh, so thank you very much for doing this. Uh, this is this has been great. The name of the book is the the indomitable Florence Finch. Um, uh, his name's Robert Morozik. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, stay safe, everyone. And again, uh, Congressman, thank you for doing this. Thank you all. Thank you all for participating. Appreciate it very much. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night.